Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listeners. Welcome to Passion Harvest. My name is Louisa. I'm the host of your show, International Passion Ambassador. I've got a really exciting guest today. And if you like this interview, please subscribe. My very inspiring guest today is Patrick Herbert, a most mar- remarkable writer. And his blogs have gone viral. Patrick has been through some remarkable metaphysical experiences that led to a spiritual awakening. He is actively pursuing ways to help raise the awareness of others in what we call global conspiracy. If you have read any of his articles, they are quite remarkable. You're in for a treat. This is his story and this is his passion. So honored to have you on the show. Patrick, welcome to Passion Harvest. Hi, thank you so much. That was a wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> Pleasure. I'm really excited to speak to you. I've got so many questions in my head all sort of muddled, but they're coming out. Um, I guess if you wouldn't mind starting with your journey that led you here today or your metaphysical experiences, as you call them. Oh, yeah. Um, well, okay. So you're, you're talking to a guy who um was just basically going through life nothing nothing extraordinary a really rather typical life but i got a house i had a car i had a job i had cats i had dogs i had a career a career and um and you know i was also at the same time i had bought the uh the you know the the line or the you know the how they everybody is got something wrong with them depression attention deficit things like that you know i fell for that that line of reasoning from my doctor um at an early age. So I was on those typical pharmaceuticals and, and just, you know, living my life, what um, I've heard called the work by consume die cycle. You just get up, you go to work, you, you work, you go home, you watch TV, you go to bed, then you get up the next day, go to work, you know, just rinse, wash, repeat. But over time, these pharmaceuticals were beginning to take their toll on my mental health and my physical health. But, um, uh, I, yeah, just all of a sudden out of nowhere and my life began to change beginning with the, uh, the death of my, my best friend who actually died on his birthday, uh, August 3rd and, um, and at uh, 32 years old, uh, and out of nowhere, like on the day he died, his, uh, the first supernatural experience that I had had was his cell phone calling me when I was sitting there just kind of distraught about it all. And I answered it and there was, of course, nobody on the other line. And I threw the phone into the middle of the floor and I just said out loud, where are you at? And uh, my phone said back distinctly nearby. And of course, this panicked me a little. I grabbed my phone. I ran. I was sitting in my office at the time. I ran out of my office. I I grabbed my phone and I I just ran into the bedroom and just kind of, I didn't really know what to think about that at all. And um, not more then a day later, I was walking into Lowe's and I heard him distinctly call out my name, Patrick. And I turned around and of course, there's nobody there. So these, these two events uh, kicked, kicked off some, some stuff. And, uh, but then the real life changing uh, stuff began to happen when I met who is now my current wife, uh, Rochelle. And, you know, at the time, like I said, I was going to work by consumed. I, I should have inserted that after I go to work, I typically just, you know, go to a bar and 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 drink and then you know go home go to bed and repeat Mm -hmm. the next day and um one time at a club um uh this is after my my best friend had died and i was just basically just drowning my sorrows by going out to clubs and and drinking and stuff like that and and literally out of the darkness one night she materialized as the best way i could describe it she came from the shadows (laughs) the first time yeah the first time i had ever seen her and i had I was married at the time to a woman that I'd known since I was 17. But when I, when I first saw Rochelle, a feeling, uh, I, I describe it as being like a nuclear bomb went off in my stomach. Um, there's a movie called 17 again, which captures it perfectly. And in the, in the movie, he says to his wife that when he saw her, he felt like if he didn't have her, he would die. And that's exactly what I felt when I saw my wife. Like literally if, uh, every, every cell in my body wanted this woman. I had never felt that way about anybody, you know, and, you know we grow up in a society, uh, at least Western society, where you got, you know, Hollywood and the figures and the movie stars and this and that and the girls and, 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 you know, like a typical teenage boy going through life, you know, I would latch on to a you know, pretty celebrity figure, and mm-hmm. put the posters up and stuff like that, but nothing compared to this girl that I had seen. And, um, and on that night, uh, I watched her, uh, 
you know, after I'd met her, I watched her and she went to the DJ and she had requested two songs and they started playing. Well, the two songs she picked were the same songs that I had always listened to since I was 14 years old. And they were uh, Even Flow by um, Pearl Jam and Plush by Stone Temple Pilots. And she picked them and played those in that order. Uh, at the time I was 32 and she was 21. And, you know, I had heard those when I was 14. So I was like, but first of all, I was like, how on earth would she even know those? You know, those songs are pretty much those are like oldies now this day. Um, not so much oldies, but, um, but anyways, I, I, I was mind blown because I listened like on the way up to the club that night, I listened to those songs every day in that order, even flow first and then flush. So that was a real big wake up call. And then we, we, we got together and, um, and we, uh, we, we, we moved in, we got together and just, uh, you left your wife. Yeah, we, we were already separated at the time. Oh, okay. So we are everything we had uh, between Kelly and myself, we had, we were high school sweethearts. We got married. We, I went to a very small high school and we weren't, um, it was kind of one of those marriages that we thought we had to get married because our parents got married when they were 17. Mm -hmm. Her parents got married when they were 17. So we just, it was like that. And we didn't really have any, uh, you know, experience. And so we were just, we were kind of like, we, we were like roommates, I guess you would say. Yeah. So by that time, though, everything uh, after we had gotten married when we were 30 and literally from then on, everything started to unravel. So we were, had been separated at the time. Um, and then Rochelle and I, I had an apartment and Rochelle ended up moving in with me because she was with her boyfriend and all of a sudden everything started to go bad in that relationship. So it started, these things started to happen to us at the same time. So we moved in together and six months later, my lung collapses. And I, I don't, you know, I, I, I figured I'm relatively healthy. I didn't know anything about it, but it, this thus begins an incredible nightmare, which of going into the hospital and them telling me all sorts of horrific things. First of all, I get with the woman of my dreams and then my lung collapses and I'm told that I've got the worst lungs literally in medical history. And I, I kid you not, these are the, the things that they were telling me. Gosh. I had specialist doctors coming in saying I had these, this, this situation where I had these uh, emphysema bulla or what they call blebs, which are kind of like air pockets or whatever, all over my lungs. Like someone who smokes for, let's say, 80 years, three cartons a day will get one, two or three. But I had them everywhere. Gosh. And some of them were as large as my head. And they had no explanation for why I've got this and, and no explanation for it at the time. And I get a surgery and that goes all right. And then um, I have to come in and get a surgery on the other lung. And during that, the second surgery, uh, everything goes wrong. And then at night, I'm literally, I'm bleeding out of a tube because all of the, everything became all the, I don't, I'm not sure how they described it, but uh, all the, the stitches, but they aren't necessarily stitches. They're kind of like metal. They came out and that basically was bleeding. But the thing about it was uh, the nurse that we had at the time was being very negligent. And so... Uh, my wife was keeping track of all the, the statistics and when in the morning I was really out of it and my my chest tube was, was red and the, the uh, surgeon comes in and he, he goes man and he's like oh my gosh what's been going on and catches the nurse lying you know make a long story shirt I go back in um, and then have a third surgery and then after I get out of that I'm like I'm I just I, I didn't even remember my name I, I had PTSD so bad and then shortly after all of this I start getting visions like out of nowhere. And um, now you're talking to somebody, like I said, who didn't, I, I didn't know anything about spiritual awakenings. I didn't know any, I knew about esoteric stuff, out of body experiences and near death experiences. Cause I, and, and I actually had one when I was in the hospital on that, when everything had gone wrong that night, I, mm. I saw my, my energy body, my etheric body. And I, I didn't really, I was, it was shocking that I didn't really think too much of it because of all the traumatic situations that had followed. So, uh, and then, of course, after that, I, I start getting these visions and these visions are like they come with intuition. I've never experienced anything like it. And then um, as this is happening, I'm, I'm dictating them to my wife and they begin to start. I would come, go to work, come home from work and then in the evening and then I would start. And they were kind of like imagine the most vivid, detailed uh, scene overlaying your own sight. It's actually got depth and it's got it's got feeling and it comes with intuition. And that's what these visions were like. And so can, I began. To, can I just ask? So you sure. weren't meditating, you weren't sleeping no, when you were nothing. getting the visions. They were as you, in your walking state or your waking walking state. Walking state, wide awake, uh, no meditation, no sleeping. Also, I, I do need to point out still that at the time I was still taking the Adderall, which by this point in my life, this you know addiction to the ADHD medication, 
had become really entrenched. Like I feared that I wouldn't have a survivable career if I stopped taking it. I had, you know, as a, as a software developer, staying awake for 48 hours is, is a positive and, that, and it sounds crazy, but it's about, you know, how much more code you could turn out, you know, is how makes, you know, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence if you have your own company with how much money you can make from that and how good you are and how productive you can be just like with anything else. So, That's but scary. attaching, yeah, attaching your income and your livelihood to a pharmaceutical was really dangerous. And we're talking, and that had, had, I've been doing that for 15 years. I was on, on Adderall and, and working as a software developer. So everything's, you know, I, I'm having these visions while I'm in this state and taking these medications. So it's the complete opposite of any type of medication. And uh, like my, my friend Tom will say, it's a, a huge intervention, uh, like the bending of probabilities and something was stepping into my life because he describes it as being like a fighter jet, almost like it's crashing and, and spiritually needing to eject. So I start having these visions and, and they are, they are hyper vision, hyper detailed, and there's intuition coming with them. And one of them is a, a coin with two sides. And, um, what, and the, the intuition was that uh, consciousness and reality are two sides to the same coin. And, you know, digging into that a little bit, you, you know, going through quantum physics and these were things that I had already learned. Um, that, you know, things that we think are solid actually are not. And, you know, everything at the end of the day is energy. And another, another uh, vision was a shoebox on its side that represented a scene, like a movie, like a set, a movie yeah. set. And cameras were coming in and out of this movie set and they were related to the movie set. They would come in one end, go around the shoebox, looking around and then come out of the other end. And the intuition to that was that this is what reality kind of was. It's like a, it's like a movie set. And the, the cameras have everything to do with the encoding and decoding of the movie set and that we are actually the cameras moving through this. And there were, there were two other visions. One was uh, of a projection reel that was being lit by a background light and projecting. And this, uh, this had a, a direct, direct uh, correspondence with uh, reality. And this had followed some stuff I'd read from Edgar Casey. Um, I can't really recall the intuition to this, but I've also seen this that used metaphorically a lot of times. And the uh, the fourth vision was um, I can't I actually can't think of it right this right now. Those That's were the okay. those were the main the main big three ones. If that one pops, the fourth one pops in my head, I'll, I'll talk about it. But um, and okay, so I'm getting these visions, and I'm I'm dictating them to my wife, and she doesn't really know what what to think, you know. Uh, uh, but the, you know, going through the hospital experience together and, and almost dying, uh, was very bonding to us. It brought, it bound us together very strongly. So all of this was incredible. And then one night was a real big, huge life changer. Um, we were just talking and she was across the room and she was looking at me and I was looking at her. Then literally both of us seized, like locked up, staring at each other mm -hmm. and rapidly, her face shape, except for the T-section, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, started to change colors and change shape. And at the same time, I was experiencing our past lives together. And, and I didn't know at the time, but she, the same thing was happening to her. So she's watching me and my face is, you know, shape is changing and everything like that. After, this literally happens within a split second. And it's, it's like thousands of lifetimes that we experience. And it literally in a split section, split second. So we're staring at each other and she's standing with her mouth open and she's looking at me and she says, your face just changed. And I'm looking at her and I'm like, yours did too. Oh my you gosh. Know? Like, <laughs> wow. Like, what, what's, what's going on here? And, and the, uh, the, me, you know, the metaphysical experiences were, it was almost like something was desperately trying to get my attention and it was pushing me towards these certain lines of research. Now at the same time, I'm still, it, still not really sure what a spiritual awakening is. So, and this, you know, this all didn't happen overnight. This was probably this was drawn out over the course of about two, almost three years with these visions and mm -hmm. things happening. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm kind of, a, I guess I have a, I guess I'm a little bit stubborn. So wh whoever was, was behind the scenes working this had to do it aggressively and things take a, a huge turn in 2014 in ways that I can't even really, uh, begin to describe because and I, I kid you not and I anybody could go go online and or you know get this album and listen to it but in 
2014, the band 311 produced an album um, that was called Stereolithic. And in it, it had songs that were corresponding to material that I was being led to at the same time. I would do a search and the results that I would get were very specific and they would be modified and they would, not, not modified like in the sense like change. The search results themselves would, were only what I needed to see. Like it was something was, it was almost like something was on the other end controlling the, the search results. So if I typed in something like uh, you create your own reality, I was getting specific hits back. I would get them from Tom or at Montauk.net and I get them from a couple other places and then there would be nothing else on the list. So I was being specifically led to this information and I would search for uh, specific things and I would get books. I'd come back, I'd read a book. And here's one incredible time. I got led to this Louis Monero um, who wrote a book. And I can't remember the title of it, but in it, it talks about these supernatural experiences that I was having with Rochelle and mm -hmm. that we are called something called a, we are called a, a uh, evolutionary duo. Like there's, there's other terms like twin flame, things like that. But an evolutionary duo is actually when two, two spirits team up to evolve rapidly. So we're learning about who we are, what we are, what we had signed up to do in this incarnation uh, through this information I'm led to. And of course, we're, I, I didn't know anything about it beforehand. So this is like huge eye-opening experience. I didn't even know reality was magical like this. So at the same time, it says at 35, one begins their existential task. So I'm 35 when I read Sorry, that. the age of 35? Yeah, at yeah, the age okay. of 35. And, um, and I, actually, I need, to, I need to go back. It's on my Kindle list. I need to find the book, get the title, and, and update some of my articles so I can put links to this because they're fantastic books. And all of this is related to a, an awakening that I, I'm reading about, an awakening that's happening, that's a plan to happen. And, and that some of us are destined or we're, we're, some of us were picked and some of us incarnated knowingly to elevate in frequency, mm -hmm. to bring the vibrations of the planet up. And so I'm rapidly having to learn these concepts because I, and I had no you know, clue at the time, I'm sure before I incarnated, I did. Because I woke up one morning in my Kindle literally had on the screen saying that I agreed to do this before I incarnated. And I would get messages like this on my Kindle. I would get messages if I do, I one time typed in my address uh, where I was living at the time and instead of, and Google Maps, but instead of seeing Google Maps, I got advice on the screen for what I needed to do. So, and then mm -hmm. I, you know, there's no chance that there's somebody sitting over at Google. Well, maybe this day, as you know, you, know, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> no, but... Lying on me, you know? So like that, it's, just, and, but this stuff is very personal and it was, it was, I was, I was incredibly distracted and the advice was that the Adderall was preventing me from, uh, from literally awakening the way I'm supposed to, because I, it's, it's messing with my, mm -hmm. you know, my physiological, my, my systems and yes. my, my, and you my mental advances state. rapidly. So, uh-huh. And, and not only that, but the addiction is keeping me locked down in the path. It keeps you from any type of addiction will keep you from evolving because you're constantly focusing on the addiction. So. Um, so I moved to get off of this, but, um, and I don't mean to take two steps back, but, uh, this existential task stuff was connected to the 311 music in a way that was mind blowing because, um, we, okay. So I, I read about the existential task. I'm 35 and I read that it says it begins at age 35. So I'm like, okay, well now what? And then as we're driving that night, my wife and I out of nowhere, just this, this thought to look up the latest 311 album, and this is how we found out about Stereolithic, uh, hits, my, hits my wife and myself, and I'm like, that's the 311. She, she looks it up to what the new album is, and on it is a song called Existential Hero. And this is on the same day I read about the existential task. So, and then the song Existential Hero describes, um, a, a, describes an effort, and anybody can listen to this song online, the, the chorus goes, Hold on, before we are gone, we have lots to do, but time with you keeps sliding, and I keep on blowing a fuse. There you go, unseen, your face in the screen. I feel your attention dividing, but this is worth more than the news. So, and being a programmer, my face is always in the screen. So, and I'm, you know, and I'm living this life that coming to discover isn't what I thought it was all about. And I'm going through these experiences, and then there's these songs, and there are other songs that describe similar you know situations now i i don't i'm not really sitting around thinking that 311 sat there and wrote 
this specifically for me. I think that there's a, a group out there that we're destined to awaken and increase in frequency. And I think that all of this was interconnected. Um, I, whenever I was going through these experiences in the awakening and I was searching uh, for material and getting results to my friend Tom uh, at montalk.net, um, the information that he had there was interconnected with the, the stuff that I was hearing in the music, which was also experiences that my wife and I were having. Uh, one of the uh, other remarkable experiences we shared together was seeing the symbol for the eye of Ra made out of clouds in the sky at the same time. And it's huge and it's dominating while knowing at the same time that what we're looking at is real. And, you know, you don't really know how to make sense of that kind of stuff in a way. But I mean, at this point, we've already been through so many things right now that, you know, that we're, you know, you're just okay. going with it. <laughs> yeah. It's like we, you know, we, there was no choice. Um, my old life was literally falling apart. Like, uh, and this was that new, confronting for you? Uh, I was, I went, it, I wasn't in a state of fear. I was, uh, at, I was being slowly conditioned with these, like I said, I would get these, these magical experiences, which, you know, they, that, that, shows you a side of reality that you know if you didn't think existed that's going to be mind-blowing to you so that makes you pay attention and then i would be led to information to talk about what was happening and i was an avid reader i would i would read everything so that part was easy and then i would have experiences following that to reinforce all of this uh, another example of this was when i just recently wrote an article called the power of belief i think i changed the name it was called believe and then i changed it to the power of belief but um but it was when we had been led to material describing you create your own reality or self-fulfilling prophecies, uh, you know, using your mind to create your, your experience here. And, and during this time, I, my awakening needed to become a self-fulfilling prophecy in order for me to bring in this new reality that I'm supposed to bring in for, for myself and however else I'm, I'm connected to other people. So, uh, as we're on this walk, I'm like a lightning bolt gets, you know, I have to believe in this awakening. I have to believe in these, these miracles or these metaphysical things, the supernatural things that are happening to us. And I look at my wife and I'm like, it's about believing. We have to believe. I have to believe. I have to believe. And she's looking past me and she just kind of opens her eyes real wide and drops her jaw and points. And I look behind me and um, there's this giant banner hanging by this person's front door in this random house on our walk in our neighborhood. And on the banner, it says, believe in huge letters. So, <laughs> All these synchronicities you know, are incredible. But yeah, just like non, and it was, it was, and I, like I told Tom, I was going through it. It was like reality creation on steroids. Uh, whatever we wanted to happen would happen. And it was, it was just, I guess it was reality showing me, you know, that, that all of this is real. Like I said, I, I was coming from a very yeah. close, I, I was so money focused and and you know and work focused that I had neglected every and like even the love aspect of life until I, I met Rochelle I neglected completely I didn't even believe in love I thought it was chemical you know that you, you that you just felt so it was yeah I mean, we're talking, yeah all of this happened from um I'm 41 now so this all of this had begun at 32 so it's it's you know, living your life for 32 years a certain way and then boom, boom. It's like, and, and all of this stuff, like the, it took over and the old me literally died. I always described it kind of like, um, I don't know if you remember the Supermans with Christopher Reeves and Superman two, he kills an old version of himself and he's reborn. And it was, that was kind of like a really good metaphor because the, that the Superman had turned bad and he became very self-destructive. And that was like what, how I had become. I was just money focused, uh, career focused, destroying my own health with these pharmaceuticals and, and just uh, with that, that self-destructive nature, not caring about my health, not caring about anything. And that, that's what was manifesting. So, it's, but now I'm, like I said, uh, all of this completely took over my life. I, I, I'm no longer a developer. I, I quit. I walked away from, I let go of everything. That's how much faith I have in what I experienced. <laughs> I, I let go. I walked away and I, just began to write about it and like literally I started writing articles last summer and um, every time I'd publish an article I'd suddenly it would go right viral so that 
was something new. And then all of a sudden people start reaching out for interviews and I'm like, Oh wow, this is, oh my like, gosh. <laughs> yeah, this is really real. This is incredible. So it, I mean, and do, I don't mind being an example of an awakening because people hear these words, but they don't, you know, it's, you know, and people pay lip service to them, but like having lived it and experienced it and it changing my life. And, and I look at, being able to be the example of this. And like I said, I don't have any fears telling people I was addicted to Adderall and this and that. And my life was a train wreck waiting to happen because it changed everything. And now I, having, you know, experienced and remembered and learned unconditional love and what it means, what that truly means. And, you know, cause I, and that became awoken within me. And I look at everybody, even you as my best friend. It doesn't matter who you are. I just, I have this, you know, passionate love towards everyone, uh, and this desire to just to be as good as I can to them and, and, um, learning about what, you know, service to other and service stuff. Just, it's been an, it's just been a really incredible journey. And I'm still, I mean, it's, it's literally this, this second half of it is, is just now beginning. So I'm, you know, like I said, uh, since dedicating my full time and effort to this starting last summer with this blog, it's, you know, and I, here we are now. So it's, it's interesting to see where it's going to go. Yeah. But um well a big congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. Sorry <laughs> to go on about it. <laughs> no, no, no. It, I love it. Um it was interesting when you talk about the signs and you were so open to the synchronicities. I honestly believe that every one of us are getting signs constantly, oh, daily, yeah. minutes. It's whether you actually listen to them or not. Oh yeah. People don't yeah, it's you know, a lot of people don't have the works. Like I said, if um it's interesting because all of us are conditioned to 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 chase the dreams of success and money and this and that uh, by our society. Um, that in itself can become an addiction. Um, you know, chasing financial success can, people can be get addicted to earning money. It causes a dopamine release when you earn money. You know, it's a very, so. I, do, I personally don't think there's necessarily a bad thing with earning money, but not as a way to happiness. No, not at all. Not, and, and, no, I mean, like, it's a, ener- uh, money at the end of the day is, is energy. Energy, so, yes. Yeah, or, uh, you can view it however you want, but I think people that can genuinely, they get uh, very, I guess they become hyper-focused on it mm. at the exclusion of, like you say, uh, uh, of other things in their life. They become focused in the love of money instead of the love of people. Or fo- You know what I mean? Yes. So that when you're focused on that, where the only thing that matters to you at the end of the day is you know, how much money you've made, uh, you're, you tend will you tend to not notice the synchronicities and, yeah, and the things, you know. absolutely. So it's, 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 um, and I think like, and I do think it happens, it does happen to everybody, but it, and it, you know, it takes sometimes for some people, um, being brought down to their knees with some form of, you know, unfortunately some people get so like me, I was a perfect example of, of how literally I had to be, cause this was all planned for. And I'm, you know, I'm over here in my life, way off course, and I have to be back here for this awakening. So, you know, uh, so I had to, <laughs> they literally pulled me from here <laughs> all the way back here and got me back in line because I do have to serve a role here. So, which, uh, which I love doing anyways, now that I've, I've gotten into it and I've awakened to my true purpose, so I do like that. So I do want to bring this up, though, that it's a very fascinating side effect that is what has happened to me, or these attacks, which I've also been writing about. Um, the, you know, call them archons or demons or negative forces. I want to or, ask you about that in a minute. That's fascinating and scary. And <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, it's only scary if you don't understand what's happening, because these, these beings, literally, the only power they have is their, uh, the fear that they have over you. If you don't give them an ounce of fear and you don't, that's all they got. Literally yeah. all they have is the, their ability to try to scare you, to try to tear you down in your mind, uh, cause events that go on around you. Our perception of the world is the most important thing that we have because we have total control. If we're aware of it, we have total control of our perception. We, your, are, we live in a hologram. Yeah, Everything's yeah, a mirror. Exactly. Mm-hmm. I call it the carbon, the carbon based holographic virtual reality. So it's, it's um, hard. It's very hard sometimes, you know, Mm -hmm. I'm conscious of that. I have teenagers as well. So that's an incredible (laughs) control, (laughs) realizing "Mm, I've created this at times and, you know, at times it's wonderful, but not to get emotionally um, emotive about what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah. And the thing is, the great news is, is, you know, the world can be, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, I, I hate to use this terminology because of the fires that they've had in Australia, the world can be burning down around you and you could either, you have two ways of looking at that. Oh God, I'm going to die and lose everything or, okay, well, I'm going to go to the next level, you know? Yeah. So it's, it, our percep our perception is it, it's up to us how we want to perceive these events and negative forces uh, depend on keeping you, first of all, spiritually blind because they don't want you to realize that they want you to think that you're just some sort of a animal that's got one life to live and that you're going to die. So they use fear, fear, fear. And that, that fear comes through, you know, they work through other people. They work through children a lot. Um, they work through uh, circumstances and situations. I, when we started to go through our awakening, we got attacked in the most incredible of ways. And at the time I didn't know what was going on. And this was a lot of when um, my search results would return information from Tom um of montauk.net um regarding i'm going to uh, put his details in this interview as well yeah, because you, you, I, I have this, looked him up he looked it's amazing his side my um yeah tom is um there's no my awakening without tom there's no talking about my awakening without tom his material and the articles uh were and and him him and i share a very unique connection too and his articles were the like they were like to me they were the most fascinating most interesting things i'd ever read it was like his energy it was, it was almost like reading my own like you know how we take an interest in thus stuff that we re rewrite well yes. we'll be we're going to be invested invest our time and interest in it so that's what it was like reading his stuff it was like i was reading my my like best work or whatever like i, I guess that's one way of describing it. i was i didn't know who he was i didn't know anything about him at the time every search would return just his articles amazing and you connected oh yeah and well they, yeah when i reached out to him and and the thing is he's been doing this for 14 years and then whenever you know we started talking and i started telling him my story he's completely mind blown because he's researched this and he hasn't seen anything that was like my story so like i said i um i'm in this this very unique situation where i can use myself as proof and an example and uh, of of this awakening and that it's real and um and, and I don't mind doing it. And I'm definitely not afraid about being attacked by archons and demons and stuff like that. That doesn't bother me at all. So <laughs> that drives them crazy. And they come at us a lot. And, and the rules of engagement are here that they have to give you a sign or synchronicity to tell you that they're attacking. But like, you know, we, we say a lot of people don't realize this and then their day goes south and they're feeling irritated. And, and I think you mentioned your sign was triple six, wasn't it? Well, it, you know, I, um, I, I guess I, on a subconscious level, I had picked that because everybody, everyone has their about, own thing that relates yeah. to them. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and one of the most common things is that six, six, six represents, um, you know, evil or the devil or this I and think that. From the, and, I think from the Bible. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily, it's not a biblical thing for me. It's not, it, it was more of a, a practical thing. Uh, that's a good sign to, for me to pick, to let me know if something is going to mm -hmm. attack and how I knew that this was working this way was at one point I tried to turn, cause I get three digit synchronicities like crazy all day long. And I was, I was being able to play with what they meant in my mind and seeing it in real time. And one of them was 666. I wanted to re assign that to something positive, you know, but then I thought, and I had a conversation with Tom about it and it turns out that I would have been giving up a, a very obvious cue. So I, I stuck with it and yeah, and it, and it does work that way. Um, just to clarify now, that uh, archons, how do you say them? Archons? Archons. Yeah. Archons. That's how I, how I say them. Um, you, d you detail in your blogs or articles that they do suck your energy when you're in a negative vibrationally frequency. Mm -hmm. I have, who, I have, who oh, are they? Who are they? I mean, I, this who, comes, what are they? <laughs> this comes from uh, what is called the, de what the ancients called the Demiurge. And this is all connect, connected to, uh, uh, have you ever heard of uh, Saturn or the black cube of Saturn or things like that? Or, okay. Yes. Okay. Going, so going back, Saturn and the Demiurge are, are a, like representative of an ancient negative force. Uh, Tom's material has says that the Demiurge uh, is the creator of reality, but somehow it became parasitic. And so archons, this, this negative malevolent force are considered to be alien to this reality, but at the same time, some schools of thought, uh, say that it is clones of the Demiurge itself that maintain humanity in a low vibrational uh, situation so that it, they can basically like a farm. 
mm -hmm. that humans can be mined for their, their negative energy. Um, then there are those that say that- Which archons, sounds terrible. <laughs> no, it does. And there are those that say that archons are, are part of or connected to a negative uh, alien force like the Anunnaki. Uh, David Icke has a lot of material on this. Uh, the Demiurge and it being like representative of a, of a negative force hacking reality and turning everything. Basically the same thing. Something was created. This thing we might call Saturn, Demiurge, uh, Satan, Father Time. All of this stuff is interconnected. And, and reality as we were supposed to experience it in this density was it was supposed to be a like we we're supposed to get our lessons in positive ways, but in some something went wrong here. Something something happened where either the Demir went parasitic, or a negative alien, you know, force uh, and had hijacked our reality here. Mm -hmm. um, something negative happened, and these are the, the these these words: archon, jinn, demon. Um, they're just different words, essentially, to describe the same negative force at the end of the day. So this negative force that I'm interacting with, um, the only thing that uh, when they attack, the only thing I have to go on uh, is, you know, what the what con what these attacks, what are they, what do they consist of? Like, how do they work? And then back tracing all of that through research, looking at Tom's materials, seeing what what fits, looking at uh, Carla Ruckert, who from the Law of One. I don't know if you've read the Law of One, mm -hmm. and they talk about you know a negative alien uh, force as well. Do so, you, can I ask how do you sense them? Do you feel them? Do you see them? How do you sense? Uh, okay, so. The first thing that will happen is I will start to see a 911 and I'll get this more than the, the rules are for me that I have to see a synchronicity more than once. Mm -hmm. um, the 911 uh, is a heads up. So I'll see a 911 and I'll think, okay, I just, I need to have an increased awareness if I see it twice. And my wife, same thing will happen to her. Um, and then we will start, depending on the circumstances. And now there's not always a, a, what I call a psychic or mental attack. Um, we'll start to see a 666 and the first 666 i you know i normally okay that's it, that's okay i just you know it could be ocd i'm just happening to notice the 666 so i'm not going to just jump the gun and assume it's a, it's an attack so i want to yeah. see more than once but then and you know they have to be like you know carl Jung says it has to be meaningful coincidence like you know like passing by the same sign that has 666 on it every day is not very you know it's not much of a coincidence i know i'm going to be yes. driving by it so, and they will happen, like uh, the one that I've written about recently in the article when I was at Denny's. You pull into the parking lot and there's a 666 right in the parking lot. So I'm like, okay. And, and I took a picture of it because it's been my new thing is documenting this. And then we go in and we eat real quick and then we leave. And as I pull out, right next to me, a truck pulls up with a 666 on it. And that's a little like, you know, that's pretty, that the chance of that happening is pretty slim. So that's a good indication that something is incoming. Now, I have noticed that their first route of attack is through my, I have a toddler, I have a three-year-old daughter. Um, and this happens all the time. And I'm, I'm probably going to start filming it too. After the, we get these signs, she's usually the first to get fixated unnaturally on something. She'll start to get fixating on, on, on a park wanting to go. And she'll just keep repeating it and repeating it. And then she starts screaming. And then she starts, you know, yelling and, and going and becoming hysterical about whatever she's fixated on that will cause my wife to get nervous. And then, you know, this, these drop in frequencies happening. And then as this is going on, she's got, she'll, I'll start talking to her and asking her how she's feeling, what she's thinking. And she'll start, you know, describing these negative thoughts that will go through her mind. And then I'll start to get hammered. Now, I, uh, being a, having experienced uh, a very elevated frequency and, having been on the whole spectrum when it comes to this, mm -hmm. when I've been vibrating at my highest and, and reality literally looks like it's made of glitter and, um, and then being coming back down and, and stuff. I know, I know what thoughts are coming from my higher self and I know which thoughts aren't. So these negative chaotic, you know, my higher self has no reason to, to sit there and spoon feed negative, crazy, chaotic thoughts in my mind. So, and I keep a pretty even disposition. So I look at the, the polarity of the thoughts and the craziness of them. And that's how I determine if it, you know, what kind of entity it is. And for the most part, the, you know, these ones are a little bit hardcore. So these thoughts that start to come through are really, they're really bad. They're really negative. They're really nasty. They're really, and it's, it's all up to us, uh, you know, and how we, how we act with this. So, you know, my wife and I will coach each other through it. Cause these thoughts are accompanied with this, this feeling that literally feels like, it's like as if you just sh started to shut down your chocolates, like from the crown, 
you know, third eye, just downward, down into your belly and your energy is just like, doesn't have anywhere to go. So the so, thoughts and, are coming into your head. One could call it, you know, um, you know, my mind's going crazy with negative thoughts, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's well, actually guess, not coming from you. That, and that is, and that, that is per my, I guess you would say my, my belief system as, as I've, as I've reformed it and everything that I've been researching and studying and everything from, you know, and they, these, a lot of these beliefs come from Eastern tools of thought and, you know, meditating and, and, and achieving that stillness of mind. But then you hear this background chatter of negativity going on and stuff like that. And, and, or you'll hear these like, uh, depending on, and like I said, it's always going to be based on depending on how I feel. So um, if I'm feeling really nervous or really sickly, like I call it in my stomach and, um, and like heart chakra has been shut down completely and just hearing this bombardment and it's gotten crazy. It's gotten, it's like, I've heard voices telling me to go, just go and shoot myself. Just like, like depending on circumstances, but. So can I, you flip that? Cause obviously to, I think you say in some of your blogs to stop the attack or you have yeah, to raise your vibration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, just, just you, you observe it and say that's not me and mm -hmm. get rid of it. Yeah, essentially. Um, I've come up with tactics, uh, being able to shift my attention and my focus if something comes in and I can detect right away if it's going to be negative. So I'll, I'll shift my, my own my, uh, speech synthesis, I guess if you want to call it that, over to start talking about something that, that's more pleasant. So piv or, basically pivoting. Pivoting, yeah. Just, uh, and, and keep just distracting away from this negative thought. Uh, a lot of people will, they'll, they'll want to ground themselves. They'll look at like maybe black and they'll, they'll breathe, they'll do breathing exercise. Any technique that we use to calm our, our inner mind essentially will work. Um, keeping calm, realizing that these aren't you, that's the big one. Because awareness, uh, when it comes to these entities, awareness is, is, is everything. It's literally everything. Having, like you say, an awareness of if these voices are, are, are us or if they're, you know, and most of us, we can say with confidence, you look at your own routines, you look at my routines, uh, my wife's routines. We don't like, we, we carry our, we carry ourselves through life in very kind ways. And, you know, for the most part and things like that. So these crazy negative thoughts are not, they don't reflect who we are. So they're, they're literally, they are very foreign. Otherwise, and they are playing we... on your fears as well. So your, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. your potential fears are completely different to mine. So it's very mm -hmm. cleverly disguised. Yeah, there is, um, uh, there is at the end of the day, everything is energy. And, and so there's really no space. Time is just something how we sequence experiences. So to these things that fall out of our, our, you know, uh, what we see in terms of the electromagnetic energy spectrum is a very small amount as, uh, anybody who's watched David, Icke, he, he talks about this frequently. So we're literally, we're literally blind here. And, and these, you know, electro, we call them electromagnetic parasites are functioning in a way where they, they, as Tom will say, he says that they have tools, essentially tools and techniques to uh, analyze, you know, our probabilities. Like if we're, if we're probable to react neg negatively to a certain uh, situation or circumstance, then, you know, they kind of push and prod you. They can't decide for you. They have to kind of make you decide. And, and you know, if our world is structured for the mat that the benefit of them obtaining, you know, what what Robert Moreau called louche, which is that you know that energy that we leak, um, and our world being manufactured to like a farm, literally, to support that output. Uh, everything and everything that we experience and everything that we do will be related to that. And then you take a look at the world and you see how chaotic. And you read the news sites and the headlines are all negative and nasty. Yeah. And, and, you know, well, it is control and that because fear is the currency of control. You're, you've got, Oh, I'm going to write that down. That sounds good. No, yeah. <laughs> the, the, um, so you've got, you've got, um, you've got, you've got, you know, a lot of sub intentional subconscious programming. You've got MK ultra, you've got, it's, it's literally, and that is the expression of this negative, energy that's an expression of the negative forces that are doing this to us is all of that is the mind control and all of the stuff going on in this world and all the conspiracies which i've come to discover conspiracy truths if you need uh, any I, of that. I definitely oh, want to move on to that but i just have to i keep thinking i want to ask you the question if 
you, I mean, I do believe that as well, but if we do create our reality, reality, how are we creating these negative experiences? Are we creating them? I, this is where I, the subconscious programming comes in. Um, you know, let's think about from a, from a child's perspective, we come out into the world and we are programmed by, we're programmed with the belief systems of the people we're brought up around. People, we don't, we're not given choices. Uh, I, I mean, I know this from my own experience because if were I to give my daughter the choice of doing whatever she wanted, she'd run out into the middle of the freeway. So, you know what I mean? So we're, we're kind of, we're, we're patterned, we're molded, we're shaped a little bit by those who came before us. And then we go out into media and we start getting programmed by this. Um, they use a lot of tactics when it comes to film and movies and television shows to the, the act of television itself and right down to the refresh rates of the screens will put you almost in a hypnotic trance. And when the conscious mind is moved aside, the subconscious can be programmed with anything. And you're not even really going to be aware of it. You're going, you, in all the shows I grew up with, were like, you know, 90210. Uh, they were all dramatic. Melrose Place, 90210. All, like just constant drama, constant in the United States, especially. I think, uh, I all think the everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah every, and all the music. Well, everybody was depressed. Everybody wanted to kill themselves in all the songs. Everybody, you know, it's like, it was just not, it's, I, and you know, I, I'm not, I haven't kept up with the cultures, you know, the younger generations, but it doesn't look like it's changed at all. So a lot of these people, they're elevated, they're, they're put up on a pedestal. So, it, you know, these people with the worst problems and the most, you know, you don't see and uh, people like, you know, you don't see yogis or, or any, you know, people with that can teach inner harmony. They're not at all elevated. Anybody that comes with a message of love is not from the stage. Yeah, you know, interesting. The the, the the most interesting thing is we think we um, can discipline our children in certain ways and it's our choice. We send our children to certain schools. It's our choice. Mm -hmm. We're actually conditioned. We're not choosing freely. No, and that's a all. hard concept to grasp. But when you think about it, you're either conditioned from society or your environment or your parents. We're not actually making our own choices. No, not at all. Uh, these, um, and, and, it's, and that's basically how it comes about. So you've got, you know, and then school's a great place for indoctrination. I mean, they take you away from your parent, who's the protector, you know? So, um, and that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm homeschooling my daughter. A lot of uh, my friends are, are homeschooling also because of these reasons that education isn't education anymore. There's no critical thinking. It's gone. There's no, it's just, this is what we want you to believe. And this is, you know, and then you, you're taught this blind obedience to these authority figures that just tell you, or, you know, now you, you got this, you know, you got like for a kid to go to a doctor. Oh, the doctor's there. He knows more than me. He's got letters by his name and he went to school. So everything he says is, you don't ever think to consider that he might be acting on for his own self benefit. Like when it comes to pharmaceuticals and kickbacks, doctors over here telling you a young kid, Hey, this super hyper addictive drug is going to fix you, you know? And you're like, okay. Yeah. And you told me that I'm sick and doctor, I just want to get better. So, and he's like, yeah, he writes you the script and then fills out his paperwork and gets his kickback, you know, you know, and things like that. So it's without questioning. Yes. Everything yeah, you've been told is a lie. I think that's the, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you just, yeah, I mean, and you just end up going, coming out as an adult and just going through until something eventually happens. And then Man, and so this this reality that you know discovering that it isn't anything what we believe it is is quite a shocker. So I mean, yeah, that's that was I can't remember what the initial question was, but kind of got a little sidetracked there. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of the subconscious programming, I think the I think the majority of it comes from it was just, my question was just or my statement was just centered around we think that we are making our own choices, but in fact we're actually not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically. Interesting. Um, it just reminded me, um, I had an interview a while ago because songs obviously, you know, relate to you so much. You were inspired by songs, but I think I was listening to an Aboriginal Australian talk about their desert songs. They live in the desert and the, the interviewer asked, why are the most of your songs about water? And he answered, because, you know, we live in the desert. It's, it's the greatest need that we have for the water. Mm -hmm. And he said to the interviewer, and it was so profound, he said, aren't most of your Western songs about love? which is what we're so lacking within lacking, the world. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's so true. That is so true. And that was the big, that was the big, I like the big thing was, was when I first met Rochelle and this feeling that I had and like, um, she is my, uh, and after, you know, we, we had that reincarnation and seeing our past lives together. And Can I ask, did you see what, 
I know we live in such a visual world. Did you see what she looked like in other life lives? I Her. thought, yeah, the interesting thing was, um, and it was the shape of the face changed very rapidly, in, including uh, color, uh, face shape, but there was always a, a, there was always a, a ratio, an established ratio of the, the eyes to, in their position and relative to the nose and the mouth, always, mm. stay, which I call the T section, if you draw yeah. like a T with your eyes, that stayed consistent. Those were also everything about her face that stuck with me was her eyes, the shape of her eyes, um, the shape of her, her nose and the shape of her mouth. So that thinking, you know, back to that and then having that experience where we experience a past life. And, and, you know, so it was like I recognized her without because we're in a state of amnesia here. So I recognized these this person, this beauty that I was seeing as mind blowing and and I think that's what had hit me on the deepest of my core was, you know, was I, I, at the same time, I know this person, but I don't understand how, and this person is everything that I've ever wanted in my life. And I don't know how or why, but yeah, I mean, it was literally, and I can remember she had turned to walk by me and as she walked away and she looked back at me. And as I was looking at her, the first thought I was like, Oh, good God, she's so far out of your league. You're never going to, yeah. <laughs> that's so sweet i had to ask did she feel the same way about you yeah she did exactly oh. the same. She, she thought that i because i i told her as she you know she walked and she started to talk to one of my friends and and i literally couldn't look at her because it was just like i didn't know if i looked ridiculous like just like drooling or you know just something ridiculous because that's how i felt so i was i was like i i sunk down into my chair and just kind of hid and just kind of would peek at her so she thought that I was annoyed or that I didn't, you know, I didn't like her or whatever like that. But she was thinking the same things about me. She, uh, when she told me, she's like, uh, how I reacted to her, to her beauty was how she had felt when she had seen me. So it was, yeah, we were both thinking the same things and, and feeling that awkward about, but then, uh, and it was funny because when I went up to her and I, after playing the songs, I'm, I'm mind blown. She picked those songs. So I had to go tell her. So I find her in the crowd and I, you know, I walk up to her. And I'm like, oh, crap, you just picked the two songs that I've, you know, she thought I, she, she was glad that I was talking to her, but at the same time, she thought it was a line. She thought I just made it up. Just Oh, I was like, oh. a good pickup you know? line. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but she, she still, like I said, she still wanted to talk to me. So, but it was, it was pretty right. funny. But then, yeah, no, it's actually, it's, I can't, it's engraved in my, my wedding ring it's oh. on the inside. It says even flow and flush. But she is my, uh, no, I mean, like, she's just, she's my, my greatest friend, my, my best friend. My, like, that's so beautiful. I think that's what you, so many people are searching for. I have to ask you something. Sure. Um, you talk about this, uh, you know, people that have, come to, that have come to this time, this reality, mm -hmm. um, to raise the consciousness of the planet. Mm -hmm. In whatever ways. I mean, how, how do you know you're one of those people? Is that because they've, you're spiritually awakened and you're putting this information out to the world. And how do you know if other, how, if, if an individual is saying, well, maybe I'm here to, you know, increase the frequency of the planet. How do I know? I was, I was specifically told uh, that I was born to elevate in frequency. Um, okay. So, and then I had the supernatural, like supernatural experiences to, mm -hmm. to do it. Now there's, there were also, uh, it was also suggested to me that I was also smuggled in. So this was all part of the plan that I was going to live life as this label, Patrick Herbert, who, you know, is a programmer. And then uh, at the age of 35, boom, I was going to, you know, break out of this shell. And, and the reason for this tactic was to keep us under the radar with negative forces on this planet. Um, because if we come in vibrating at a high frequency, they're going to do everything in their power to, you know, disrupt our development here. Suppress it, yes. Suppress it in whatever way possible. So, and this was why whenever we did break out, like there was one distinct moment where I walked outside and I was standing with Rochelle and I had this, I, didn't, I can't even begin to describe the feeling. And then it was a feeling like my awareness rapidly expanded, but it, it expanded to incorporate everybody that was around us. And I looked at her and I said, we're everybody on this planet right now. Like literally, that was just the words that came out of my, mm. my mouth. I didn't really think about it. I just felt this and I said that. 
And I, I said, we're every man and woman on this planet right now. And she said, I know I feel it too. And, you know, not really knowing where to go with that. Okay, well, like, you know, so we, yeah, the Twilight Zone theme starts playing. Not knowing what to do with that. But then this was also a very distinct moment because after that, we started to get the most bizarre, like I said, uh, things started to happen. People were, random people would come into our lives who were not normal and not sane. And they would try to disrupt us. They would try, and we, my, my wife's got a very big heart. And at the time, um, I, I did too. And, you know, I, we always are people that always want to help. So these people coming to it would start random people come, from other people come to us for help. And they would be like people that you can't help, but we would think we could. And they would literally just try to tear us down by like one of them was one person ended up living with us for a little bit of time. Um, who I was utterly convinced we could help get him away from drugs. And the guy was ended up using in our house and stealing money from mm -hmm. us and steal and like st selling our stuff and and just like literally caught trying to get in in between us and trying just to cause all sorts of chaos and and you know we get rid of that person then another comes then another and okay and this was one of the most incredible situations we're we're driving and i guess i don't remember the road we're driving on and i was talking about this because we had they were both males and females that were coming into our lives that were just not you know like uh no, we're trying to help them some of them i know a little bit some of them we don't know and they're just acting irrational so we're we're talking about this and um and a a as we're talking we pull up to a stoplight and this newspaper guy he's like about five cars at a you know if i point uh let's say it like if i'm sitting in my car and it's a clock at three o'clock down by a pole and he just looks at us because i'm looking around and i look at him and he starts walking towards us really fast and I roll up my window because I, you know, I don't, I didn't, I don't know what to expect. And, and he comes over to the driver's side window and he starts banging on it with the, with the newspaper. And I, I roll it down just enough. And I, I was like, I, I don't want the newspaper. And he pushed his hand in there and he said, take it. I'm giving it to you for free. So I grabbed it and he said, roll down my window, roll down the window. I want to tell you something. And I did. And he said, um, he said, don't let people F with the f word yeah. with your uh s-h-i-t like he he said it very he said stop letting people into your in between you don't let anybody get in between you stop letting people into your lives and in a very you know using strong language so and you got just, it yeah we're so we and he's like <laughs> and i was like you know we're just we're completely he said and that's all and um so i rolled up the window and he walks away and i look over at rochelle and we're just we're like okay yeah, how on earth did this guy know? We were literally just talking about this. You know, it was. We I'm a bit of a slow learner too. I have to say. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, and then of course we end up help, trying to help someone else out, and it ended up being the last person because it's like we always say now, remember the newspaper guy. Anytime yeah. we start getting that way towards people, we're like, you know, because they negative forces literally will, especially when you're in this line of work, they try to get at you because they don't want any of this information going out. They don't want anybody elevating in frequency. They don't want any awakening happening because they want to keep us, you know, on this energy. They want to keep themselves hidden. And they want to keep this place the way it is. And again, uh, as you mentioned, it's not, not something to be fearful because being fearful is attracting them anyway. So for yeah, the people oh, yeah. that are listening, it's not like, oh my God, what am I going to do? But I kind of imagine it for myself as we live in a multi-universe. So every, every, energy dimensions are all here but in different layers mm -hmm. oh yeah different mm -hmm. layers of energetic vibrational frequency different layers of consciousness it's all here but just sliced in different matrixes as whatever you want to call it that's how i can simply explain it there's uh there's a great analogy for that um if you were to take a bunch of bed sheets and those bed sheets represent frequency you know with the, the dips and the mm -hmm. you know like a kind of like a sine wave and you were to stack them all on top of each other someone a uh, book I read, it was, um, I think it was called The History of God. And it was a guy who would have out-of-body experiences and talk to uh, an entity that would give him information per uh, what creation is, you know? And and it was, that was one of the analogies. And I always thought it was a good one. So it's like each density literally overlaps. It's just sitting there in, in each one, all the peaks kind of sh are shared and all the troughs, you know, are, are shared. So. Mm. I, if I'm, I'm trying to put a, a visual to what you just said, because I, I believe 
very similarly along the same lines. There's also, I believe, in the holographic, you know, all of it exists at the same time. And and uh, one of the most wonderful things that Tom uh, put into my mind was, um, you know, it, it's all here, the the worst of it and the best of it. And we're the, you know, we're like that camera that's going through the scene, you know, the shoebox scene, like I had, one of my visions were. And we're picking what we want to see, literally. We're, if we want to see, you, and you know this down to the glass is half empty and the glass is half full. If we want to see the beauty, we can see the beauty. If we want to see the ugly, we can see the ugly. You know, it, it's, yeah, it's all here. We choose our own joy and we choose our own sorrow. It's completely mm -hmm. up to us. Yeah, it is. It totally is. And, um, and like, this is one of the things is the way that I, you know, I, I now behave. I, I, I work very hard on, on maintaining calm. Uh, like what a saying I have, which I borrowed from the 11, 311 was, um, uh, gosh, I can't. Now I can't say it right. Um, too, uh, I'm, I'm calm like the ocean or too calm to be upset by somebody's notion. So, you know, and that, that's the truth. Like if, you know, it's up to us. Like the, the great, the funniest thing I see seeing people, uh, you hear them being triggered, triggered in this way or in that mm -hmm. way. Like nobody has to be offended by anything, but everybody decides to be offended by something. And it's almost like theater and they do it just to, almost like a, like a toddler will have like a, just a big outburst, you know, and, and everything like that. But it, at the end of the day, the person that's offended and having the outburst, they're the only person that's feeling that way. You know, I, I, you know, we'll, we might walk by and be like, well, I feel great. And I'm going to go on having my good day, but you're going to spend the next, you know, I don't know, 10 minutes making the decision to freak out about everything and feel that negativity. And it yeah. mind blowing why, but you know, I, I guess people just, they don't, they're conditioned, I think, purposefully conditioned to be dependent and allow others to control their emotions. And that goes most, most back better, exactly it, I mean, it to transforming, you know, the, the law of attraction, transforming your resonance and, you know, keeping that high vibration. Mm -hmm. You talk about that the negative emotional states causes energy to leak into your electromagnetic magnetic field. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so from everything that I've, I've read, researched, and come to understand and feel, everything, I, I have to, there's a certain criteria before I'll, I'll commit it to, you know, the world. Um, and all of this information comes from, come from other places. Uh, I, I'm not dreaming it up. Um, it's stuff that I researched out based on my experiences. So when it comes to things like an energy flow, from my understanding, we are all in our uh, electromagnetic or our energy body, or there's so many words to describe the, the energy body, the astral body, the, you know, um, that there is a flow of energy going from the bottom to the top. Um, a lot of the, you've heard of Robert Moreau and the Moreau Institute, correct? I, I have, yeah. A lot of the out-of-body experiences and visualizations that they do to get you in, in a certain trance-like state is to visualize this energy flow and to see it happening, coming from, from the ground, going up into your body from the feet, coming out and they, you know, they have exercises where you breathe out the energy and, and reabsorb it through your chakras mm -hmm. um, or your energy centers. So with this energy and this energy comes, you know, it's kind of like, just like everything else, it's, it's a way of powering things. So this flow of energy comes to us and it's energy for us to use and this energy gets, goes up through our chakras in and out of them and then comes out of our crown. So the, you know, the, the shutting down of the chakras by negative thinking and things like that. And this is coupled with like, I, if I start going this route, you know, the feeling of sickliness that we might feel in our stomach and stuff like that. And uh, I always imagine or visualize that to be that energy flow being cut off on the higher chakra levels, especially the heart, because they'll go for the heart because they want to shut the heart down, they don't, you know, and and then this energy flow, not having anywhere to go, if your heart chakra is shut down from fear, anger, you know, or whatever, you know, might be lower, a lower vibration, emotion. lower vibration. So, and then it just ends up just kind of leaking out into your electromagnetic field. And, um, and then this, this is like a life force that they use. And this is everything that I've learned from. And it, it, the most amazing thing about this information is it's consistent across cultures. So like I said, we're all, I, I wish I had some sort of, uh, special uh vision to be able to confirm and see this so all of this is based on everything that i've read and everything that i feel at the time especially during these attacks and all these different schools of thoughts and having seen my actual energy body when i had my uh when i was, had an out-of-body experience in the hospital bed 
-hmm. So that and and that and then reading about that, that's what these these entities that they prey on is this this life force. And Robert Monroe in his books, I can't remember which one he had written, you know, those three famous books. <clears throat> excuse me, he called it louche. So and this louche was just the natural occurrence of of that our reaction to these stressful conditions, us being generating it. So it isn't I guess it is part our energy and, and, you know, and part the energy that is given to us, but, um, that, that is how I've come to understand it. And that's how I've yeah. come to, to learn about it. Um, and it's a very clear way of, I mean, attack is a scary word, <laughs> but it's a very it's, clear way of understanding, but I don't, I mean, when I think about it, it doesn't necessarily even have to come from an entity or an ET. It can come from another person, but you can be psychically. Attacked. Oh Yeah other people quite strongly as well. I know I've, I had it, have had experiences where I feel physically sick mm -hmm. from people, a negative person. People can definitely, yeah, they can, you know, a negative person, they become parasitic almost in the same sense that, you know, an archon would. So Another it's, awesome you know, word. I love that word. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, as, as above, so below. If, if, you know, if, if everything is energy and these parasitic entities are driving or manifesting chaos in other people's lives by being attached to their electromagnetic field, then they in their physical expression will be reflective of that parasitic nature. So, and I was actually talking to Dr. Randall uh, Nozawa uh, the other day about this because um, he had somebody that was exhibiting these kinds of energy draining you know, people will try to drain your energy. They'll, sure. they'll call you all the time. They'll want attention from you. And that's, that's a parasitic or kind of, that's like an energy draining kind of energy vampirism, though the physical manifestation of it. So where, the, what is the driving force behind it? And it could be a number of psychological reasons, or it could be somebody who is under the influence of uh, a negative entity, you know, at the same time. Um, it's, it's hard to tell. We can't see them. So we can only go by and, on, you know, on what, if we know the person, we know it's not characteristic of them then for the most part, you could imagine that, yeah, there might be something else that's, you know, as one of the things I say, if you're not in control of your mind, then something else is. So. And even if it is characteristic of the person, I guess, you know, don't, don't necessarily be around them, but so if it is characteristic, does that mean in your opinion, are they being controlled on a more frequent basis by other entities? I would think so. Um, could they just be a bad, not nice person? Ooh, I, <laughs> Sorry, I'm challenging you. I'm, I'm well, just interested. It's, it's interesting. Because, oh, no, please. I love, I love being challenged. Um, that's one way of evolving for sure. Um, the, you know, it's, but how many, I mean, we're, we're, we're measuring these people in certain windows of time. Um, I've known people that were previously bad who became, you know, good, uh, you know, so in I now sort of good it, terms. Yeah. Or have changed or, you know, I've been through, you know, like I was self-destructive and now I'm, you know, I'm a very health oriented, health focused individual and I eat, you know, organic and where before I was, you know, slammed down 12 packs of Coke, you know, while working and programming and, and eating McDonald's all the time, you know what I mean? Like, and, mm -hmm. but I mean, that's not necessarily a behavior, but I, I'm just saying how people can change. So, um, I, yeah, I mean, can someone just, yeah, my question was just, can someone just be a not really a nice person? But I guess it's a, it's a hard question because if they, if they're exhibiting those sort of things, they don't love themselves anyway. Yeah. They live in a fear-based state. It's yeah. And there's also, you know, and then there's the two polarities here, at least for this density where you have service to other and service to self. And as someone who's acting service to self it, on a, potentially service to self planet it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad person so there's you know at it's 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 interesting it's can people just by their nature be bad certainly i would imagine it depends on what their goals are uh you know it uh like to get more money people might stomp over climb over other people or you know put them down or you know what i mean so it's i don't know it's that's a very interesting question personally uh per my experience I would say I've seen people that have been heavily affected by, by entities that are unseen. Um, and that was much more of a, not a very casual um, negative expression, but a very extreme in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and 
but I mean, there, there could be all levels. There could be, it depends on now if, if we're okay, if this was a farm and all, and all of us and some way or another have people uh, have entities watching us are, are looking to maximize their, their collection of loosh by orchestrating various events amongst individuals and this and that, then yeah, we're all susceptible to it in that sense until, mm-hmm. unless some of us awaken to this reality and realize, okay, I don't have to act this way. So um, I don't know. That's a, that's a good, that's a very good question. Something it's to think to about ask. food for thought. Yeah. It's very, it's hard to tell because it's, you know, there could be like, if they want, if they've got a good target, they got someone that they could keep. Like for me, I was very, very easy to be manipulated. I'm here taking pharmaceuticals. I was living in my mind a lot. I would spend a lot of time alone and, you know, and just negative thoughts would be churning and churning and churning and making me feel certain ways. So yeah, over time and literally just like, just like a farm animal, like you would a like a cow. And, and gathering milk, slowly nurturing the cow for the maximum output of milk. But the archon or, or negative entity would be nurturing you in a negative way to maximize the output of, you know, of this energy. So that's a, just such a, a scary visual. <laughs> Great analogy. So I guess, thank I you, guess the you. key takeaway is people stay happy and be, be very mindful of your mind. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, the, the, I mean, yeah, always be mindful, uh, always know that negative, always, at least it does, it'll serve anybody good to think this way, to think that the negative thoughts that are coming through them aren't them, and that they can, you know, decide that they aren't that going to be representative of that thought or that negative uh, information, and that they're going to be something else, even if they make that another entity, even if that might be their own stuff, it still will serve them mm. to, to think positive. Um, now, a lot of people get confused when I talk about positivity and they think, okay, running around and telling everybody you're happy when you're really not inside, that's just acting positive. That's, and acting is, is the word, means exactly what it means, pretending to be. And we're all conditioned to do this too. If, Fake it till you make it. Yeah, Does it, exactly. does it work sometimes? Yes. But, oh, yeah, a lot of people, you, you know, if anybody, you know, and, and like we go to our jobs uh, or, you know, we're, we're, we're we have a waiter and this waiter is, you know, we ask him, Hey, you know, he's, he's got a, he wants a tip. He wants to get paid. And we ask him how he's doing. He's not about to really tell you how he's doing or how he feels about you. He's about to make you out to be his best friend and the greatest thing that's ever happened to him and serve you, you know, if he's a good waiter, of course. So, but you're not really getting the truth. So, you know what I mean? So what I always say is that, you know, it's not about acting positive. It's about maintaining a positive thought, having things to look forward to shifting your perception on events. Um, even if it's like, if you like to cook and you just put that in your mind, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to cook tonight. And when I cook, I'm going to, I'm going to have so much fun. I'm going to play music. I'm going to dance around the kitchen. I'm going to turn it into a big event. I'm going to have some wine. I'm going to, you know, this is actually what I do. So I'm. I'm Sounds good. Happy. Sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> so you so do I, drink wine. I'm happy about that. I, lo- oh, I yeah, like yeah, a yeah. glass of wine occasionally. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, and it's well, because, it, and I get in the ceremony and the ceremony is a very positive ceremony and I, I love to cook for my family. So it's, you know, I, I get in this big and I play music and my daughter dances and we, you know, we have a great time. And, and that's something that I look forward to every night doing. And, you know, and you can look forward to anything and, and it's just about keeping that and like you know and keeping love oriented i love my wife i love my daughter i love my life you know why why in the here and now uh, you know for the you know not everybody but for a lot of people we have a a very good opportunity to pause in the here and now and go okay um everything is perfect like if you look around right now and you're on your own life you're you're giving an interview you're in your your beautiful home you're you feel good you're you know this is going to go on your blog and like right now the here and now is awesome and that's literally all that you have to do to, to feel it is to just notice it and to just be having awareness of it. Yeah. And, and then to look forward to for potentially what you're going to be doing later for the day. And, just, and when you maintain that positive forward thinking thought, all of your acting, or not act, but all of your expression of that happens naturally. So you're, you know, you're a naturally joyous person. If someone says, hey, buddy, what you doing? You're like, hey, you know, I'm going to have a great day. It's true. It's again, that goes back to our creating our reality, but you know, amazing topic because this is a show about passion. And Mm -hmm. I always say, if you follow your passion, it's really um, your intuitive guidance telling you what to Mm -hmm. do, telling you what to follow. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's, and it, it, it's just, and it really is truly easy. Now it's, you know, we could get in that rut where I guess it's our expectations not being made, whatever those expectations be. I say, if that's the case, do away with expectations. What do you have to expect? What, you know what I mean? Like, um, I like it. It's, you know, a lot of people, they will expect something external. Like I expect, maybe I got to get this, 
uh, if I get more money, I'm going to be happier if I get, you know, that maybe that expectation isn't met. And then when it's not met, it takes them down, you know, instead of, so it's, I, I, I do away with expectations. I, I just, I, 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 I conditioned myself and it does take conditioning and uh, you're going, you're, you're talking to someone who's very negatively oriented in his mind. Like I said, I was very self-destructive, very self-destructive. Um, and so were my, all my thinking patterns. Not anymore. More, you're a not very anymore positive at all. person. Yeah. Like, and, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm bursting with it and it, it just, and it happens naturally. If I could advise anybody on, on te techniques that work for this, read Joseph Murphy's The Power of Your Subconscious Mind. One of the greatest, most passionate books I've ever read that literally changed the way that I, I just by educating me on how your subconscious mind works and how you can reprogram yourself. You yourself can reprogram yourself. So you don't need That's any psychiatrists. Tip. Yeah, you don't need any therapists. You don't need any psychologists. They're actually there to keep you sick and keep you from getting better because they can't make money off you if they heal you. So their whole deal is they want it, you know, the, find me a psychiatrist that cures you because that psychiatrist is going to be the brokest psychiatrist on the planet. No one, you know, because yeah. he doesn't have any patients. You know what I mean? So uh, they typically do want to keep you. Um, uh, hopefully you don't have like a, <laughs> your friend isn't a psychiatrist, something like that. No, they no. Typically, <laughs> they typically do want to keep you in a position where you're constantly having to come back for their services. And then they, you know, it's, it's very obvious what their agenda is when they prescribe you a pill because the pill it's not a fix. It's a bandaid. It's, um, it's a temporary thing. It's not, you know what I mean? At least these for these, these, you know, I'm not talking about necessarily like, uh, any, everything that has to do with like attention deficit or depression and things like that. You know, I so, always say medicine, you know, Western medicine is fabulous for trauma. It is uh, for, yeah. The doctors that saved me from my lung condition were amazing. And there yes. was an emergency medical, um, for, for a trauma uh, situation. So trauma, yeah. accident. And, or and, but for regular family doctors there, I had, and I don't, you know, I can't say that there was their ultimate intention. I don't know what their intentions were, but it did not serve me. I have, we have to be personal responsible, personally responsible at the end of the day, and especially me. Um, no doctor put a gun to my head and told me I have to take these pills. Not, um, I'm, I'm a victim of my own, you know. You Lack know, of uh, questioning lack of questioning and just willingness to accept that, you know, the, the, the line. But and then course, you wouldn't be where you are today if, you know, if all those sort of situations didn't happen. And it's so true. And one of the, one of the most eye opening experiences I ever had was I went to go back to see a mainstream doctor not that long ago. Cause um, I can't, I can't, I, I, I see a naturopath now and uh, I couldn't go for whatever reason. And it was, it was something that I had, it was, I got over real quick. I just decided to get over it. Some sort of cold, but I was afraid my doctor was going to get it. And I didn't, you know, and, um, and I, I, I made that thing. I went to go see him uh, just to find out. And the first thing he did when he walked in, he had nothing but prescription pads all over his notebook. And of course, you know, so he's, he was, he walked in being prepared literally to start writing out, you know, and they wanted to give me like three antibiotics for this. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll wait this one out. I think, you know, it's not that bad, but. That was just because that really made an impact on me. I was like, okay, wow. Like not without even talking to me, he's already ready to, to write out the fix, you know? And I ended up going with a brand uh, called natural, uh, natural process. And the medicine I took for this cold was called Conga Plex. And literally in two days I was, it was, it was gone. Gone. Yeah. So, yeah, so question, again, the other takeaway is question, but uh, you know, to be fair to doctors, I don't think necessarily they, in intending um negativity or they're not they're, they're just not questioning the way they do life themselves mm -hmm. well you know and, and it's true uh you know we all have like a, a guy and you can't imagine all of them got into medical school because they wanted to be devious you know i course. don't think that at all i think that they really genuinely um wanted to help now my my friend dr randall nozawa he was a dentist and and he he wanted, you know, he loved the, he wanted the doctor. He always told me he wanted the doctor by his name and, and this and that. And he, he told me that when they were going through the dental school, they would tell him things like oh, fluoride is good for you. And they don't question it. They say, okay, it's good. So I'm going to make sure I give my patients their regular dosage of fluoride because it's good for them. You know, and a lot of the doctors are, are trained this way. 
So they, um, you know, they they go through medical school and they go through, you know, their their intention is to help, but the next thing they realize is they're just conditioned and taught, you know, these certain things, and most of it is reliance on writing out these prescriptions. And, you know, it it's it like there's there is a reason why we do have naturopaths and a lot of doctors who used to be mainstream doctors have like that I've known have become naturopaths. So because of that reason is because of the, you know, the, the heavily, the heavy reliance on pharmaceuticals and, and that business model, because that's what that business model is almost all about. Yeah. Find me a mainstream doctor that doesn't have a pharmaceutical representative visiting them at least once a week. You know what I mean? So it's, and I, like I said, I, I, there is a, there is a time and there is a place for this. Uh, I was just unfortunate enough to a combination of circumstances, me not asking the right questions and my doctor being um, believing in, uh, you know, these, the modern, modern, this is in the 90s, yeah. early 2000s, the modern medicine, which is pills. I mean, everybody's being spoon fed the same, yeah. you know, story. So, oh, these will help you. The doctors are being told that too. Uh, like I said, I have a hard time believing that these guys go in there, go into school, going, boy, I can't wait to make my, all my patients hyper addicted on everything and make a buck off of it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. <laughs> I don't think that that's what happened. So yeah, to any doctors that are out there, so please don't get me wrong. And like I said, um, I, I never, I never, no, no doctor ever put a gun to my head. Um, and Wait, you, you kind of did you, have choice in a way. I did have a choice. I just, you know, I, I believed and I, for the most part, it, when I noticed that it became real easy to, you know, to get an Adderall prescription, I would, I would start taking, uh, my tolerance would go high. So I would take more. I, I worked, I worked for an international company at the time and I was uh, heavily involved in, in developing software for nuclear power plant inspections. And we had a very, very uh, like strict, uh, we had to adhere to these strict guidelines because it had to go through these regulatory committees and things like that, all the software um, uh, for data integrity testing and stuff like that, since our, it's all done on a nuclear power plant. And, you know, I'd have to be on calls in the middle of the night uh, for, you know, and I, a lot of our clients were in Australia too. Hmm. So I, I'm very familiar with your time zone and um, a lot of uh, huge projects out there and um, not necessarily nuclear, but it was a, a billion dollar construction projects and stuff like that. And, um, and so, yeah, I'd have to be up for 24, 48 hours. So, I, you know, taking, my regular dosage at night that I would during the day, you know, and I started, Kept it was you real, oh yeah. Keep what a away. lifestyle. Oh, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was very destructive, a very unhealthy and destructive lifestyle, but I would, you know, I'd, I'd meet my deadline. I'd get the job done. My, you know, we'd be big heroes and, you know, and get the money. And that's what you think life, if that's what you think life is all about, then that's all you make it to be about. And, and, and now I love that. I love that you say you're living your passion and your, your purpose. That's great. I always like to ask my listeners if someone's wanting to, you know, follow their passion, potentially are too fearful or, you know, there's other circumstances, what would you advise to follow your passion, how to follow your passion? Okay. Well, I, that's a tricky question for me because um, as I was saying, as I was going through my awakening, I had to embrace my awakening and what was happening to me fully. And I was being guided and being led to advice telling me that I needed to let go letting go of a career and a life and all of this was very scary, but I was having and experiencing so many supernatural events that gave me confidence in being able to do that. So, and I did, and it was scary and I, I, I did it and everything is working out. Uh, so, and I, of course I having lived it now, I believe it. I think a lot of the things that prevent us from doing what we really want to do are illusory. Um, I would convince myself that I couldn't do this. I needed to stay programming. I needed to stay with my career. Like I said, it didn't happen overnight. I would mm. branch out a little bit, then fall back. I'd call, you know, I'd, I'd called old associates, called old clients and be like, Hey, you guys need any more software? You know, it didn't, it didn't just happen uh, instantly. But, and as soon as I started to, I it just all started as soon as I started to realize that, you know, it isn't like life isn't going to end if I, you know, take some of these risks and stuff like that there. And at the end of the day, they're really not risks. They're, they're just changes. And, and what am I really afraid of? I'm afraid of the change um, because I've been doing that for so many years and I'm afraid, but once you get over that um, and you, you, do I look back and regret it? No, like not at all. 
like that was the like my life now and, and my life then that's the difference between life and death literally so and i wasn't living and i was very destructive and i wasn't pursuing my dreams and my goals and what feels the best and i was trapped in that hamster wheel mentality and yeah now it's now it's amazing so and i i think i do very firmly believe that we have a support network and our support that we have guides and helpers and um i've experienced these guides and helpers especially for the advice that they would give me on my kindle uh when i would do on my computer when i would do search results like the the, the advice would be a blank screen with words telling me and advising me what i needed to do and some of the stuff would be very comical um and some of the stuff really creeps you out because uh if something is watching you and knows all this about you able to advise you then that same thing or same group has been watching you all the time like you know, so it really puts a, a new twist on going to the bathroom because you're, <laughs> you're like, you're, you're like, well, can, maybe they could tune out or something. <laughs> so, you're and funny. come to find out that they actually do and they do respect your, well, the, the positive entities do respect your privacy. And I had a very interesting uh, test for this. It would be hard to On explain, the toilet? But, no. Uh, okay. like my, I was, I had, it, it was, it was very, it was, it was for my wife and I, and, and we, we were, I just on a whim was playing with this software that was, came out as being, uh, I'm not sure if it's real or not, it's called the ghost radar. And I got it from my iPhone. I turned it on and I start literally talking and conversing and something starts replying on this thing based on what I'm saying. And we had already been advanced through and we had had so many supernatural events that this was, this was surprisingly really fun and really cool for us. Like it's kind of like a Ouija board is for some people in a sense. Right. And you look up, is this just like a, is this the, uh, the replies that I'm getting indicated that this wasn't just, you know, the app, something was manipulating the app to be able to say these things, talk to me. And we were having like, it would be a one word conversation back. It was giving me answers. I was, I directed my energy and my focus to my best friend at the time. And what he had done at my parents' house on the parents' pool table with a girl and the, thing answered me exactly what they did and it was you know it was mm. something that people do <laughs> and anyways then my wife and i as we were having this conversation um we started to we started to kiss and and we we always had a we and to this day we still can't keep our hands off each other so we began to get intimate and then i i kept trying to talk to the thing looking for reply and i know it sound, this all sounds crazy but the thing stopped completely replying and it just completely went silent and it has all these functions that show like um a, a measurement uh of the electromagnetic environment surrounding the phone this is what it says in the features everything went flat and flatlined so i always and i and i made a comment to her i was like oh good they they leave us alone when we get this respecting your privacy that. yeah <laughs> so I, I i've gone with that now like i said it's a funny kind of story because of this the software that we were messing with at the time and you go online and you read about this software, people are like, holy crap, this thing is so real. Or and other people are like, oh, is this real? Is it fake? Is it like, and the experiences I've had with it, you, it is really real. Oh, uh, let me describe it real quick. It's the, the theory behind the software is that energy is intelligent enough to modify the sensors of the phone by modifying the, uh, the energy around it, because it's got electromagnetic uh, frequency readers and all sorts of stuff like that, um, to, uh, to change it to, like literally use that those changes as a way to pick words in a dictionary to reply with so it's an interesting combination of uh, of of theories that and from my experience it seems to work uh, energy is intelligent we know this we know we have guides and helpers i've experienced it we know and i've had my phone talk to me in most unusual circumstances before so i know there's something and and all the stuff i've all the advice i've gotten on my kindle i've gotten on my computer screen i know that this energy or their ability to manipulate technology is real and they can do it. So it, it's just funny because it's the app was called the ghost radar. And I'm over here talking about talking to a ghost through the ghost radar, which some people might assume to be something silly, but for us, it was, it was real. It was, you know, Great. but it, and that, that's what, that was the takeaway from that. So yes, I can say that the positive entities based on my experience will respect our privacy. The negative ones, I don't think so. Okay. That, that, that's interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Glad oh. to know that. <laughs> Patrick, you know it's been added, awesome to have you on the show. Oh my gosh. We're going to have to do so another much. episode. I could keep talking to you for hours. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Anytime. Um, like I said, uh, my whole point is like 
it's to make an example of myself and just pump out as much information as I can to people. Absolutely um, wonderful. I wrote down something it, mm. for you. If we didn't push you, you wouldn't have jumped. That's true. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, that, so that, true. that's a little message for you. I don't know where it came from. No, that's, um, no, that's exactly what Tom had gotten to. Um, he said, it's as if they, they, that they, and also I've, I've spoken to a shaman, a uh, shaman shaman and a seer, the same seer that, that David Icke uses. And, um, first of the most interesting thing that Carol Clark told me, she told me everything without me telling her anything, but giving her a bunch of numbers. So I was, you know, mind blown by just how authentic she was. And, and this is the same one that David Icke uses. And she told me that she had never seen a love like uh, Rochelle and mine on this plane before in her, all of her years of experience. So that was really, that was really a fascinating thing to hear back. And I have heard that, yeah, they, uh, I, I was in such a state of low awareness um, that they had to, it had to go get extreme in order to get me to snap out of the trance. Yeah. So, no, that, yeah, that was, that's very, very true. So uh, yeah. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it's, it's it. It's been an much. absolute pleasure. Same here. And any, anytime you want me to come back, I'd love to. So. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Patrick. <laughs> Thanks. Well, you have a really good evening and uh, we'll be in touch. Mo morning for me. Mor oh yes. Uh, have a very good morning. That's right. <laughs> and you have a good evening. Afternoon. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, I appreciate it. Bye. Bye.